um, uh, on a rather serious subject um, uh, that all of you will be familiar with what's happening just now in, Be in uh, Belarus. Um, uh, those of us who are committed to the rule of law and human rights must be really alarmed uh, to watch what's taking place on our television news. And uh, I want to start by saying I want to thank um, the Doughty Street Chambers, um, which is one of the, the leading sets of chambers in international law and human rights, and uh, my uh, own Institute of Human Rights, the International Bar Associations Institute, um, and the many people who have agreed to be on this panel, who all, have, all come with a, a wealth of experience. Um, my name is Helena Kennedy. I, uh, I uh, am a member of Doughty Street Chambers and I'm currently the director of the Institute of Human Rights for the International Bar Association. I'm a member of the House of Lords and uh, I uh, have been a practitioner for um, more years than I care to count. Um, I, I wanted uh, to start by saying that the, the, we've, we've all seen um, the horror of what's taking place. Um, there has been an authoritarian uh, uh, leading the government in Belarus uh, for far too long. And the people of Belarus uh, clearly have a yearning for something else, for a different way of living, uh, for, a, for their rights to be recognized, to live in freedom and peace and justice. And they're not getting that. And so the international community has a responsibility for us all to provide support to our colleagues and, uh, and, and friends and fellow citizens and, and so on back in Belarus. And I just want to say that this is an important occasion for us, not just to spell out what's happening there, but also to try and think of ways in which we can be supportive and we can take this to, uh, uh, you know, to, to take this further and find some resolutions. Um, I'm going to start, um, I've got a great group of panelists and I'm going to um, in introduce them all to those of you who come online to watch this webinar. Um, and I'm going to ask each of them to speak um, for 10 minutes. Um, uh, so let me start by introducing Natalia. Natalia uh, Sazukevich is, a, is, a, uh, is based um, at the Vyazna Human Rights Center in Minsk in, in Belarus. And it is the, the main human rights uh, organization in Bel Belarus. And she was, has been in the past arrested. She was arrested in, as, as an observer at protests in uh, 2015. She's had that experience. Um, she's watching it happening to people whom she knows, um, um, even in these days. And um, she has run programs educating lawyers in international human rights. And she is a, a, a great uh, a champion of, of rights uh, in her nation and in that region. And I want to just pay tribute to you, Natalia, for all the work that you do. And Natalia, why don't you kick us off and start this with a description of what's going on, and then I'll take it around the group and go to Constantin and to others um, to talk about uh, the legal position um, and, and the st steps that we can take as collaborators and as, uh, as persons concerned about uh, the situation that you're confronting. Natalia. Uh, thank you so much, Helena. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you. And thank you all for your interest to, to Belarus and your support. We really see and feel it. Um, and I will give you a short review of what is going now, well, the last months. Um, and, uh, but my main idea is that situation in Belarus is complicated and changing every day and even every hour, so you have to check information, really. Uh, you all know that on the 9th of August, the Belarusian presidential election uh, culminated in, ele in election day, uh, which took place against the background of continuous repressions um, and atmosphere of fear and intimidation in society. And um, unfortunately, the electoral process did not meet international standards for free and democratic elections. Um, the elections were marred by numerous violations and falsifications, uh, which does not allow to confuse the results announced by the Central Election Commission as a real reflection of the view of the citizens of Belarus. Um, and this uh, distrust of the official election results led uh, to mass spontaneous peaceful protests uh, both in Minsk, the capital, uh, and in other cities uh, across the country. 
uh, attempts uh, by special forces of the Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs to use disproportionate physical uh, force, riot gear and uh, weapons to disperse the assemblies resulted uh, in numerous injuries to the participants. Uh, and uh, at least three protesters were killed um, as a result of the use of weapons or failure to provide uh, timely medical care. Um, and we, uh, during the last months, um, more than uh, 8,000 uh, citizens were detained uh, for participating in a peaceful protest. And uh, unfortunately, as we see for the last two weeks, um, uh, we fix protests every day. Um, and also we fix uh, detentions uh, of people of protests every day. Um, um, but I um, also have to mention this ma mass act of human rights violations that uh, took part uh, after the 9th, uh, 10th, 11th of uh, August when uh, people were detained and uh, tortured on police stations. And uh, for today we have um, more than 500 documented cases of uh, torture uh, and we continue working on this field. It's very important and unfortunately there is no official investigation or any actions from the government um, to do something with it. But at the same time uh, we know that the investigative committee opened uh, criminal uh, proceedings um, under the article 293 of the criminal code. That's uh, mass riots against more than 100 people all over the Belarus. But under our opinion, there were no mass riots. There were only peaceful assemblies and uh, disproportionate use of force uh, from the police. Uh, and also I want to mention that um, dozens of journalists were persecuted by the authorities for their professional activities. And on the 1st of September, two days ago, we saw uh, again how journalists were detained and they are uh, arrested. Um, some of them are arrested even now, though so they are waiting for a court trial. Um, uh, and that's only because of um, their professional, of doing their professional duties. Uh, we know that journalists were repeatedly detained, beaten, uh, deprived of accreditation and deported from Belarus. Uh, in several cases, uh, also weapons were used against reporters. We have a lot, uh, some videos of such acts. And uh, also widespread uh, censorship was um, imposed in the country. Access to many news sites, sites of civil society, including our site of human rights, uh, Tentaversna, uh, was blocked. Um, access to the internet is uh, periodically disrupted. As you know, the uh, first three days after the election, there were no access uh, to the internet um, in Belarus. Uh, and uh, the number of political prisoners increased uh, during the months. Um, for today, there are 41 political prisoners in detention. And unfortunately, we have uh, a lot of candidates uh, also to be political, to name them political prisoners. Um, we deplore the, the existence of a deep human rights crisis in the country, which affects um, almost every aspect of civil and political rights. Um, but um, we work now, uh, sure, 24 7 uh, to offices in Minsk and uh, 16 offices uh, all over the country, uh, trying to help uh, people in different uh, variants. Um, but um, I think the main point I want to mention is that unfortunately uh, we don't see any action uh, from the government um, to solve the crisis or to start any dialogue with uh, civil society. Uh, authorities try to use uh, repression to stop um, any activities. Um, thank you. Uh, Natalia, thank you so much for that. Um, I, and, I, and many of those, uh, the detail of meant much of that 
people might not have known, um, uh, the number of people who, who are political prisoners that there are, the ways in which legislation is used in, 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 with, you know, in such a, an appalling way, um, the, the whole way in which um, demonstrations, which are absolutely um, peaceful protests, are being dealt with in the most violent and aggressive manner by, uh, by really a, a sort of a state oppressive forces. And uh, I mean, Lukashenko, we've watched him. I, I've been in, in a supporter of the Free Theatre there in Belarus for many years. And, uh, and, and watching this escalate and people saying enough, no more, we've had enough, um, uh, is, is, is inspirational. Um, Kansensen, I want to ask you to come in. Um, uh, Kansensen uh, uh, Zeziaru, I'm not going to pronounce your name properly, and so you should say it when you start. Um, is a professor of human rights at Liverpool University and a friend to, to colleagues here in, uh, in uh, Britain and is known for the great work that he's done around the European Convention on Human Rights and, and on the administration of international justice. And, uh, and he's uh, been a great force here and raising uh, the issues of Bel Belarus for people who knew nothing about what went on there. It's sort of a, 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 a place that people know so little about. Uh, if it weren't for you, Kansensen, a lot, a lot of people wouldn't have known what was going on. So I, I want you now to, to just uh, explain the work that you've been doing over the years um, and with, uh, with great courage, please. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Helena. I'm not going to complicate my uh, speech straight away by pronouncing my name, my surname. Uh, uh, so my student... <laughs> yeah. my, <laughs> My students usually call me like that fella, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, Constantine, as, as, as much as I normally get. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And uh, I have to say that uh, uh, I moved to the United, well, I, I moved outside of uh, Belarus 15 years ago. And I have to say that this August was the hardest uh, in my life abroad and it was extremely emotional it was emotional roller coaster uh, throughout these uh, these months and uh, I, like i wanted on the one hand wanted to be there in belarus and uh, be with colleagues and friends and at the same time i'm very grateful to my adopted country to the united kingdom that i'm uh, able actually to say whatever i can and uh, without any uh, um, uh, threat to my physical health. Uh, so uh, to describe the situation in Belarus, uh, I, I wanted that just to give a short introduction that Belarus now lives in some sort of two parallel informational re realities. Like uh, one comes from the government and this reality shows that those protesters are like uh, prostitutes and drug addicts, uh, those who have uh, absolutely marginalized the people and they don't uh, absolutely like the, 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 there is no point in at even engaging in dialogue with them. And there is the real reality when you all can see on, 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 the, on the screens when like you have uh, YouTube or internet or anything like uh, there is nothing like that as people who want to uh, live in a different country, and that's it. And for that, they're beaten, they're persecuted, and they are absolutely abused. So I, I uh, actually, I wanted if I can share my screen now. Um, if it works, uh, let me see. Yeah, it should work now. Um, I, I, I just, I just uh, uh, wanted to uh, make a couple of points uh, today. First of all, I wanted to echo what Natalia actually said, that there are plenty of fragrant violations of human rights uh, happening in Belarus. And then I wanted to also mention that there is absolutely no national uh, uh, mechanisms remedy that can uh, deal with these uh, human rights violations. Although they technically can, there is a facade of uh, uh, independence of courts, but this is only a facade and it doesn't actually lead to anything. And uh, then I will argue that these two points, they lead to the obligation on behalf of, of, of all the uh, international community to act somehow to make sure that uh, those human rights violations are not uh, uh, left uh, unpunished, that uh, uh, the authorities will have, uh, uh, will, will 
will bring the uh, respondents will bring the responsible people to uh, uh, criminal or any other form of responsibility. And I will be to prove it. I will be using the terminology of the European Convention on Human Rights. I know I, I know that the Belarus is not a party to the convention. I know that for far too long Belarus uh, is not the member of the council of the last effectively the last European country which is not uh, a, a party to the uh, to the uh, member states of the Council of Europe. But I think it doesn't really matter in these particular circumstances. Uh, it doesn't matter because uh, uh, it, it, uh, the, the, the uh, body of law that is created by the European Court of Human Rights is, is uh, uh, generally applicable to the region, I think. And also Belarus is a member of the uh, ICCPR, International Covenant on uh, Civil and Political Rights, and the uh, standards are pretty much uh, very comparable. So let me just begin. I will not take too much of your time, uh, and I will show that every single right in the convention was uh, interfered with during these uh, two weeks of August, effectively, two, three weeks of August. As Natalia absolutely rightly said, there were uh, at more than one person killed in the uh, clashes between police and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the protesters. And these uh, killings, they must be investigated. There is an obligation, a procedural obligation under Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights, and it doesn't feel that this obligation will be uh, complied with. Moreover, there is a negative obligation. The police simply shouldn't uh, uh, kill people, protest in people, uh, and that's a violation of Article 2. Article 3, no even need to talk about that. We have all seen these awful images of what actually happened after people got out of these uh, <clears throat> uh, detention centers in Minsk. They were beaten. They were uh, they, they couldn't walk properly. There were uh, reports that uh, uh, women were raped. And again, there is an obligation on the behalf of the state to investigate. But there were reports that say that as soon as people come uh, to the police to say that they were um, beaten, that they were tortured, uh, these people were prosecuted for participating in uh, uh, illegal protests. So basically, they, they like this is victim blaming is uh, like to the maximum degree here, you know. And obviously, Article Three is a use cogens issue. It's a universal issue, and uh, the Convention Against Torture was uh, um, ratified by pretty much every single country in the world, and still we have exa obvious examples like this. And I, I, like Natalia obviously said that uh, there are uh, uh, numbers of uh, uh, reported cases. In Article 4, uh, prohibition of uh, forced labor, there were instances when people were forced to go to the pro-government demonstrations under the threat that they will be uh, fired from their jobs. Yeah, so that they will lose their jobs. Uh, Article 5, where should I start here? Article 5, it's right to liberty and security. It's right not to be arbitrarily arrested and pretty much uh, six, seven, eight thousand people were absolutely arbitrarily arrested for doing nothing more than uh, expressing their uh, dissatisfaction with uh, this absolutely sham of election. Article six, uh, right to fair trial. Well, this is the crust of my one of my arguments that's saying that in Belarus there is no uh, particular uh, remedy that could in, 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 in independent uh, remedy that could actually deal with all these uh, violations. We know the reports about the fact that judges would go to the detention centers and they automatically uh, approve uh, the uh, uh, prepared uh, 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 the prepared uh, uh, protocols and uh, judgments. Uh, that would send people uh, to uh, prison. And uh, 
We also know that there were no access to uh, legal help. The uh, uh, barristers, uh, the defenders, they couldn't get to their clients. And there are plenty, it's not a, a one-off case, uh, an odd one. There are plenty of cases like that. And uh, uh, Article 6 rights, if, 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 uh, if Belarus was the member of the convention, there would be like thousands of applications to the European Court of Human Rights in the very near future. Uh, Article 8, uh, there were plenty of uh, reports about uh, the fact that uh, uh, the phones are via tapped, that there, is, uh, there are huge interference with right to privacy. There was absolutely, as Natalia said, there was, uh, uh, and this issue uh, interplays with Article 10, it's uh, freedom of expression. Uh, there were reports that people couldn't access information. Uh, the huge number of uh, websites, they are blocked, uh, and uh, this, is, uh, th this is an absolute, uh, this is something that is widely known. It's not, I'm not saying anything that is uh, um, uh, problematic in a sense. Now, uh, even Article 9, freedom of religion, uh, there was like, uh, uh, this is a picture when the uh, Catholic Church in the center of Minsk was blocked by the police. Uh, and another example, the Belarusian citizen, the head of Catholic Church in Belarus was not allowed to come back to Belarus. So he went to Poland uh, for a couple of days. And when he, when he wanted to return, he was not allowed to return to Belarus. This is scandalous. Uh, um, Belarusian citizens should be allowed to go uh, back to their home. And uh, apparently he had to go back to Poland. Now, Article 10, I have already told you that Article 10 is also, is, uh, is, is obviously problematic. It's uh, uh, freedom, freedom of expression and uh, uh, there are plenty of examples that uh, journalists are detained, detained for nothing more than uh, uh, basically reporting about uh, uh, doing their job, report, reporting about demonstrations, about protests and stuff. And I think that uh, even today, a group of uh, uh, journalists wanted to talk to the Minister of Internal Affairs uh, to discuss this issue, but he just didn't want to talk to them. And uh, also, like, there are plenty of reports uh, that BBC, for example, uh, reporters lost their accreditation in Belarus, uh, Deutsche Welle, etc., and, like, the key uh, newspapers. I know that I'm running out of time, but uh, uh, just very quickly, uh, uh, right to peaceful protest, there is nothing to say. There is, it would be, like, plenty of violations here. And finally, so, like, what sh what else should happen? I I I ask in order uh, for international community to do anything. Like in the beginning, I was extremely extremely um, uh, disappointed, disheartened as to like an absolutely no reaction from international community. Right, the response of international organizations was absolutely. Uh, um, not adequate to the complexity and difficulty of this situation. The Secretary General in, of the Council of Europe, for example, in, in, the, in, in her first uh, reaction, just said, look, like, Belarus is not the party to the, in the, is not a member state, so be it. Yeah, don't violate human rights. That's it. Yeah. Now, uh, there are plenty of ways of dealing with this fact-finding, uh, the international community must do something about that. Of course, the UN would be the most logical uh, choice there because the, uh, B B Belarus is a part of, uh, is the party to the UN uh, since the beginning of the UN, actually. And uh, however, again, the reaction of the UN was very, uh, how would I say, calm to the situation. Uh, the OSCE, there were talks about like how the OSCE can involve, uh, the, there is the so-called Moscow 
procedure or Moscow mechanism of fact finding and sending uh, the uh, reporters to the country. But again, this is a very politically charged issue. I think that uh, the Council of Europe can do something about that. The, uh, for the last, uh, I think, uh, 10 years, like the co collaboration between Belarus and uh, uh, the Council of Europe intensified, and it doesn't matter that much in these particular circumstances that Belarus is not a member of the Council of Europe. I, I made this argument, and I think that this argument needs to be made even, uh, even stronger. And also the, the European Union uh, and the Council of Europe need to uh, join forces and try to uh, be effective in uh, uh, dealing with this crisis in Belarus. And this is indeed a crisis. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Kansasin, thank you very much. It was, um, you, uh, you, you really took us on a very important journey through the ways in which there have been such egregious uh, abuses of human rights um, and pointed out the, the, the failure of the international community. And, uh, and it will help us with uh, our discussion as we go through as to who should we, or what should we be doing? Should we a fact-finding mission? Who can undertake that? Should we be putting pressure on international organizations to do it? And if so, which ones? And what would be the fallback position if none of them do? So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm now going to ask um, for Elena Korosteliva to uh, uh, address us. Elena is a professor of international politics at Kent University, and she's the Jean Monnet Chair um, of European politics there. She's, uh, her research focuses on politics, the politics of Europe and of the European Union, um, and uh, uh, relates uh, largely to uh, Russia and uh, Eastern Europe. Um, but uh, I just wanted to mention particularly that um, Elena is involved and she's the principal investigator for Compass, which is a way of, of connecting um, and linking up um, academics throughout the former Soviet Union in the countries that were, were once part of, of the Soviet Union. And in trying to create that kind of continuity of, of intellectuals um, who might uh, collaborate um, uh, on, on the events and things that are happening in that part of the world. So it's great to have you with us, Elena. Um, uh, it really is. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. And just to say that Compass is not just to connect academics, actually. I think the beauty of Compass is also to connect it with policymakers and community engagement, just to triangulate all three, which I think actually matters, especially in this particular case. So being conscious of the time, um, I'm not really going to be in a position to tell you all you need to know about Belarusian politics today. Uh, but instead, um, I just would like to focus on recent events as a scientist to try and make sense of it all uh, before we can actually consider any credible solutions to the crisis. And I'd like to do that from a complexity thinking, uh, mm -hmm. which unlike other classical uh, theories, for example, understand change as emergence, complex and non-linear which means that we cannot use existing templates or try and resolve the crisis outside in or top down we, uh, using external solutions. Instead, we need to pay more attention to the local and especially to the people involved in people, their lives, experiences and beliefs. So here is my intake into why, what and how. Why? Well, classic theories uh, probably at this moment that I would suggest seeking compromise on an international level involving major powers, international negotiators, sanctions and security solutions is necessary. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just saying that if we are to put it in the context of complexity and crisis especially, that we actually might miss out some important and critical details to make, uh, to make this future compromise more sustainable, kind of bottom up grown from inside. What then? Uh, what we see today is simply a system in crisis, which had been shaped by centuries-long suffering to be molded today into a quiet and resilient community of people, ultimately longing for dignifying and peaceful li living within and outside the system. Very simple in that way. Even the hardships of the early 1990s um, you know, associated with crippling economy, loss of earnings, um, daily hunger, Chernobyl and so on, were all unobjectionably adapted to because people believed in a better tomorrow. This tomorrow, however, is yet to come after nearly 30 years in the making. 
having become the commodity of one, the president of Belarus, who trades on past sufferings to make tomorrow look like progress of, to, uh, uh, of, of today. So the system has clearly lost its balance and now seeking to restore its own equilibrium in that way. So how, um, uh, how to do it is a big question. This is why attention uh, should be given to the local and the person, and this is why it is so important. What Be Belarus has shown today, uh, moving now into the fourth week of public demonstrations and brutal state violence, <coughs> is the awakening of Belarus uh, peoplehood, which is not nationhood, it is something more. It's about mobilization of the people, all, all walks of life and all ages, which serves as a catalyst and amplifier of change and its inevitability in many ways. It is important to understand what makes this mobilization so powerful and so resilient for us in order to kind of find suitable solution out of um, uh, and exit out of crisis. We deal today with people's emotions, which even overcome fear and pain. We deal with identity and a sense of a good life as a struggle for collective tomorrow. In the words of um, Tatiana uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska, it's the country for, for living rather than leading. Um, we, we deal with growing community activism stimulated by COVID-19 when the state refused to recognize the pandemic and people simply mobilized to support and help each other and help the vulnerable. All these bring, about, bring out this incredibly powerful moment of becoming the peoplehood, relying, uh, sort of rallying around, you know, Belarusian symbols, songs, uh, traditions, telling us that these people simply cannot be governed as before. And the balance can only be found through self-organization, bottom up and inside out. So what kind of solutions in this particular case? This is where I don't really have the answers. Otherwise, you know, it would have been easier to kind of go and advise <laughs> the government, uh, I mean, the people and the international community as to what to do. Short term, definitely cease violence and free prisoners and response to citizens complain in a proper legal way. Um, then perhaps um, to, given that, the government, uh, the president refuses to engage into any talks with the coordination council, perhaps indeed seek to kind of to call for all Bel Belarusian council. I don't know whether that would be a, a possibility, but if it is organized in a proper and transparent way in terms of having representation from all different parts of society, that could be a solution in terms of them sitting together uh, to try and find the, the way out. Medium term, support and definitely uh, set up and support local council for, reform, for reforming governance and changing the constitution. Change of constitution is important here. And of course, new election. A new election that has to be organized with the presence of international uh, observers. And long term, of course, being an educator, I will always support education. And at this moment of time, I think having the um, Belarusian economy in free fall we need to ensure that people will not suffer despite all the uh, 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 coming crisis, impending crisis, and also uh, potential sanctions. So what is clear today is the, that the awakening has happened, and this is very important, and it is also uncompromising. How can we help a system that needs to find its own equilibrium? That's why it is becoming a bit more complicated. In the context of today's session, I think by showing that justice should be and will be served uh, is very important. And that together with international uh, community and constantly bringing attention into, uh, of international community to Belarus, we will search for better ways to help the nation to become free and more resilient. But this is where I leave it open for discussion in terms of how to basically move forward in terms of specific uh, solutions and I would be happy to answer any questions. Elena, that, that was very interesting and, and challenging us to, to think of some, of some of the political things that we should be calling for. Um, I, um, 
I'm going to ask Miriam Lexman to come, come on now. Um, Miriam uh, is a Slovakian member of the European Parliament. Uh, she's of the Christian Democrat uh, movement, and she's a champion of freedom and democracy worldwide. Um, and Miriam, uh, uh, I'd like you to uh, come in and, uh, and help us with this. You've heard Constantine and, and Elena talking about, and, and Natalia talking about what's going on, but also talking about some of the things that we could be doing. And I know that this is, this is not a member country of the European Union, but can't the European Union um, be uh, uh, collectively um, doing something here? Uh, I just wondered if you could help us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the floor. And I would like to thank the organizers and uh, you, Helena Kennedy, for organizing this event because it's very, very timely, very important. And I really like the angle of the, this event, which is through the human rights uh, angle and the kind of legal angle. And that's why I would mention only two issues, which I believe that uh, people who are lawyers and human rights lawyers where we can have uh, help with. Uh, first is the atrocities which are happening in the country. And I believe that it's absolutely vital that we do our best to help the people in Belarus. And there are, there are human rights organizations like Viesna, for example, to help them uh, to find ways, what is the best way to monitor all the events, all the atrocities which are happening there, because this could be absolutely crucial in a in couple of weeks or months times when the regime, we will be able to bring uh, to, um, I mean, or approach the regime from a legal way and the people and the perpetrators will uh, now uh, be afraid that they will be facing consequences. Because obviously, if the information is uh, shared, that uh, the atrocities are monitored, then also the perpetrators might think twice if they are going to commit the crime or not. And I, I strongly believe in this uh, because I, I think, I, uh, I mean, there are a couple of examples uh, from countries like Russia where, where people said that as soon as for example, people started to be sanctioned because of breaking human rights, individuals, if they're individual sanctions or brought to international trial, the people who are uh, police guards or people who work in the prison will think twice if they will commit crime against the people or they will only do their job. Of course, they cannot, if the regime uh, puts someone in a prison, the guard in a prison cannot uh, stop this but the guard in a prison can behave differently and probably can uh, help that the people are not tortured and that the, the conditions in the prison are at least uh, as human as possible as the conditions in the prison allow for. So I think this is, uh, this is absolutely vital. I have still in mind uh, uh, a story Mikhail Khodorkovsky has told me some years ago that he said that when uh, the EU and the US impose sanctions, individual sanctions, because of uh, people in, uh, involved in human rights breaches in Russia. He was that time in prison, and the prison was very close to the Finnish borders. And he said that the border guard, the, the prison guards started to behave much better because they were afraid that they'll be put on the list and they'll be not able to do their shopping in Finland. So <laughs> this is something which we do have uh, in this global world, sanctions or trials of human rights uh, breaches also in countries which don't belong to the EU or not uh, to the international community or are not uh, signatories of the Human Rights Convention of the Council of Europe. There's still ways, especially because we live in a global world, how to address this, uh, uh, these atrocities and help them to limit them or, uh, or help to the people to, to face uh, consequences. And that's why I believe that uh, the human rights organizations who are trying to monitor the breaches of human rights uh, need help from lawyers and from organization, international organizations like yours so they know what is the best way to monitor and document the atrocities because they need to know 
what are the procedures, what information they need to collect. So this information can be later on used uh, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, I mean, on, a, on an international level as a, as a way of pressure. Uh, the second issue, which I believe is also uh, related to international law, is the actual elections. Uh, because I think that there is no uh, unanimity on the international level how to approach. I mean, we all know that we need to call for new elections, but I think we have to think about two issues. Uh, first, first issue is that to find out what would be the best way how to, how to reach these new elections. Obviously, I mean, we cannot change the regime. I mean, we can be strategic. We can make pressure on the regime, pressure on Russia, which is backing the regime, obviously. Uh, now with the case of uh, Navalny, we have another way how to pressure. The, the German colleagues from the European Parliament are now uh, making an international call to stop Nord Stream 2, for example. So they are political ways on an international level, how we can make exert pressure on Russia and on Lukashenko regime that they will uh, allow for new elections. Obviously, this is a very long and very difficult way, but I think that there are two issues mainly we need to, we need to make a decision about as an international community where there is so far, uh, in the first case, no unity, and the second case, I don't think that we have been thinking strategically yet. The first case is, how to call uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Because many uh, international politicians or politicians from EU member states call her uh, a president-elect. I don't think that this is the right approach because if we declare the elections as no legal, we cannot pick someone as a winner of the elections. And maybe this is what I would like to see uh, views of, of lawyers because I, I'm not a lawyer, but I think that the, we would end up in a difficulties when we call elections as not legal and then we choose someone as a winner of the elections. And the second issue is, which is even more important, is to what to do after the 6th of November if Lukashenko is going to be re-inaugurated into his new office or new term. Because obviously from that day, from our point of view, he's not legally president of the country. And th this should have consequences, legal consequences on the international level, how uh, international politicians or institutions approach the country and it, how they practically uh, change the, the procedures in such a way that the, the president will not be representing the country vis-a-vis -vis these institutions. So I have, uh, I will finish here. This is more questions than, than answers, but I thought that because this uh, event and is the only event I'm attending, which is kind of really uh, organized by lawyers and focusing on the legal issues. That's why I mentioned these two issues because I believe that this is something we as politicians sometimes don't underestimate, but I think this could help us to strategically shape our approach to, to the regime and help the Belarusian people, Belarusian people in their fight for freedom. Thank you. Miriam, thank you very much. Um, and the questions are really the, the, the pressing ones for us. Uh, I mean, one of the things that we have to offer, and I know that this isn't true of Elena, but one of the things that we have to offer is that we are lawyers and that as lawyers, we may have certain kinds of strategies that can be lent to this struggle um, and, uh, and, and ways in which you can actually use law uh, to certain ends. And inevitably, at the end of the day, it's politics and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's people's movements and things that will create the change. But there are strategies that can involve law and, and that's why we should be lending our, our, our expertise on this. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Miriam. Um, and I, I, I would, I've got a contribution I'd like to make in relation to some of those questions that you raised, but I'll keep it till the end. Uh, Sergei Dickman, um, who is, um, uh, where is Sergei? Sergei, is, are you here? You're with yep, us, Greg. Yep. Um, I can't see you, but uh, is, is a Russian. And he is the program coordinator of the Human Rights National Implementation Division of the Council of Europe. And so he has, he's a great international uh, expert on international relations. And uh, Sergei may be, answer, be able to answer some of the questions that have, have been raised. But uh, Sergei, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to the all organizers for inviting me to speak here. Uh, in fact, my role is a bit tricky because obviously I'm um, 
as a as a as a human being, as a person, I'm I feel very sympathetic to all what's going on in, in Belarus. And uh, just like uh, Konstantin, I had also uh, sleepless nights in 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 the middle of August, watching all the events which were unfolding there. But I'm here to speak on behalf of the Council of Europe, and uh, I would like to uh, kind of outline the, the the status of relations between Belarus and um, and the Council of Europe right now, and also to respond to some criticism which has been um, spoken out by by some of the speakers about the alleged lack of uh, uh, reaction uh, to the events. But first of all, we need to understand that the Belarus is unfortunately not yet a member of the Council of Europe. And if you look at a European map, you'd see that this is the only uh, gray spot uh, surrounded by uh, by all uh, by all the members. At the same time, uh, of all non-members, uh, the Council of Europe probably has the closest uh, relations uh, to Belarus. Not only uh, because back in 1994, it was once uh, invited as a um, uh, to have a guest status within the Parliamentary Assembly, which was later suspended in 1987 after the uh, referendum which consolidated power in, in, in presidential hands and by which actually the death penalty was, um, con the application of death penalty was confirmed. Uh, and this, this suspension is still valid, but still uh, the Council of Europe, uh, the Belarus for the moment is uh, a member, is a party to 12 uh, treaties of the Council of Europe, which do not require uh, the membership and the uh, organization. So it has obligations um, uh, towards other countries and towards the uh, Council of Europe in line with these treaties. Um, it is um, subject to monitoring mechanisms of, 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 for example, Greco, you know, the group of states against corruption or uh, Greta, the group of um, the convention mechanism, uh, which was created to monitor the implementation of the convention against trafficking in human beings and so on. And uh, on top of that, there is, as Constantine already mentioned, and uh, very strong and large, there has been strong and large cooperation with in, in ultimately all areas the Council of Europe is, is, is working on. Um, uh, and the cooperation went both with Belarusian authorities and uh, with the civil society. I uh, work in the part of the Council of Europe, which is dealing with human rights and rule of law uh, issues. And we in particular were closely monitoring the situation with application of uh, death penalty there and uh, tried to support campaigns uh, for its uh, abolition. Uh, and in addition, we were uh, realizing programs uh, with the state uh, authorities, with judges, with prosecutors and with um, law faculties and faculties of international relations. So we worked a lot with students. And I must say that um, we all know what's happening now, but at times you, uh, when you work individually with people, with individual officials there, you see the genuine interest in, um, in, um, in the Council of Europe, um, in the Council of Europe uh, standards and in the Council of Europe um, 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 uh, norms, which are including those which are pronounced by European Court of Human Rights, and in fact, this is one of the uh, rationale of, of 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 close cooperation of the Council of Europe with Belarus is that the the law of the European Court is not only applicable to member states, but you know, first of all, there is a um, increased uh, borrowing of 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 interpretation of legal provisions by different courts in the world. Then the UN human rights treaty bodies uh, jurisprudence is influenced by the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, uh, finally, the Belarusian authorities uh, look very carefully at all the developments in, in the field of administration of justice, for example, or how different procedural guarantees are organized in the member states, in the former Soviet states like Ukraine, Russia, Moldova, in, 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 in the Caucasus and Georgia, Armenia and so on. And they, there were many occasions when uh, literally uh, many practices or many legislative solutions, which were already in line with the standards of the uh, of the Council of Europe, were put in place or were in process of putting in place in Belarus. Of course, all this did not prevent um, the uh, the events which unfolded, but I strongly believe that they are of a different nature, and um, they are of nature of how the power is 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 organized and. Definitely the first, uh, it is quite symbolically, that the first reaction of the Council of Europe to the events came from the president of the Venice Commission, uh, of which Belarus is an associate member, and it is actually represented by 
the vice president of the Constitutional Court of Belarus, which uh, last week announced uh, that the Coordination Council of Opposition is unconstitutional. So uh, Mr. Gianni Bukikio, he expressly stated that uh, the elections as they were held could not be treated as in line with the electoral standards, uh, European and, and actually global um, electoral standards. Um, then came a very strong worded uh, statement by uh, Rick Thames, uh, by the president of the Parliamentary Assembly. And this is only natural because Parliamentary Assembly is, has special relations. It's first of all, it's the most independent bodies, uh, the most independent body of the Council of Europe, right? It is composed of uh, independent MPs. And so they are free um, uh, to say uh, whatever they feel is needed to say without looking back on the capitals. Uh, and I am sure Mr. Cherevich will, will speak more about this um, today. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, there was another uh, statement, a uh, joint statement uh, just last week uh, by the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, the um, Foreign Minister of Greece, which currently holds the chairmanship and uh, the President of the Parliamentary Assembly, uh, inviting uh, uh, Belarusian authorities to uh, release immediately all detained protesters and to stop the ill-treatment, uh, to investigate, urgently investigate all cases of ill-treatment. And uh, it has also invited strongly to the dialogue with the civil society, meaning also those who are currently in opposition. I believe this is the, the reaction which, um, for the moment, uh, could only be expected from uh, the Council of Europe since the organization is not the European Union. We don't have the, uh, the sanctions mechanism. And after all, uh, we cannot even impose, um, you know, we cannot even lift um, any delivery of any, any um, financial benefits as the European Union does uh, with its uh, aid uh, to Belarus because the Council of Europe only delivers non-material goods. It delivers knowledge, delivers expertise. And um, I remember well when after 2000, the crackdown of 2010 and the falling repressions, which were unfolded in 2011, um, there was a deep freeze between relations um, of Belarus and the Council of Europe. But they already started to slowly unfold in uh, uh, 2012 and they started with cooperation with the law faculties because by all means, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure some of those speakers today could, could confirm this. When you work with uh, uh, Belarusian students, you inevitably form um, the future uh, of, 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 of uh, the country, uh, country's elite, and including of those who would be taking decisions um, when uh, the current uh, leadership changes uh, one day. Uh, so, and then coming to what could be, to, to the point of what could be done now, what will happen now, uh, so for the moment, uh, all um, council level programs are, uh, cooperation programs are on hold, um, except those which are, uh, which target the civil society. Uh, back in, in the mid 2010s, uh, during the, 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 the cold relations between the country and the organization, the council also had the practice of supporting uh, civil society organizations which are based outside Belarus, for example, in, in Poland or Lithuania. Uh, in, such as the human rights, Russian Human Rights House, which is based in Vilnius, or there was a support to European Humanities University, you probably know this is the University in Exile, uh, which is also based in Vilnius, and uh, the Council of Europe organized a, a number of uh, very targeted um, workshops for lawyers, including those who, who still practiced in Belarus back then, on um, not just how they can apply, obviously they can't just apply the, the standards of European Court of Human Rights, but uh, they can try to use some arguments, to use some, some, some legal reasoning, and to do this is the maximum you could do in, in, in a legal way in Belarus right now, because the system is designed in, 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 in a sense that you cannot achieve much, uh, because so, somebody mentioned today in the beginning that uh, the legal remedies are not that effective to put uh, the least, or they are virtually non-existent at times. Uh, so, but uh, at the very least, the lawyers can try to challenge and to defend their clients in courts. And this, this, um, the help that the council group would try uh, to pursue in through its uh, cooperation projects. Otherwise, uh, all kinds of ideas uh, of what the council could do through the Venice Commission, through its political bodies are welcome and um, I think most speakers know the channels uh, how to, to reach it and I believe that the role of the Parliamentary Assembly should not be underestimated here. Ms. Tikhanovska will be 
is about to speak in front of one of the committees. I think uh, this uh, next week, and uh, I think this, in this sense, um, there will be some uh, political influence on, on the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergey. We were just losing you a little bit there towards mm -hmm. the end. Mm -hmm. The connection Sorry. was uh, was difficult, um, but thank you, thank you very much indeed. Now, um, we've had all of our panelists. We've had this great um, and wonderful array. No, 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 Laurie, Laurie and us, um, forgive me. Uh, Laurie and us has still got to come in, John Avicius. Uh, Laurie and us, I, let me introduce you to everyone. Uh, Laurie and us is a, a professor at the University of Vilnius in Lithuania. And he has previously been an advisor to the Prime Minister of Lithuania. He's a, an expert in international uh, relations. And, uh, and of course, um, uh, um, has been the receiver of, uh, of a number of the people who've had to flee because of threats being made on their lives, including Svetlana. So, um, Lorena, um, please, um, over to you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Big pleasure to be here. Uh, what I'll try to do, actually, I'll present more political perception which we have about what's going on in Belarus here in Lithuania, uh, perhaps more generally in Baltic states, because Baltic states and Lithuania usually are those who are most active, uh, most uh, outspoken, let's say, about uh, things going on in Belarus. So. Uh, three blocks of my presentation. First, why we care about Belarus, why it's important. Secondly, how we approach what should be done and uh, how to change things in Belarus. And the last thing, okay, what is of concern regarding uh, events which we are witnessing today in Minsk and uh, in general in Belarus. So, uh, first of all, uh, Lithuania, all Baltic states, uh, we have specific uh, <laughs> relations with Belarus due to historical reasons, due to uh, human contacts, let's say, human-related cultural reasons. Uh, there are a lot of security concerns which are related to Belarus. Uh, and of course, there, is, uh, there are economic issues which are important for us. So uh, as you perhaps know, uh, we used to be, I mean, Lithuania and Belarus, we used to be uh, elements or uh, parts of the same political units, uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania, Soviet Union, uh, sadly, but uh, as well. So uh, we actually lived in one state for many, many years. Uh, we, we still have that, uh, okay, I would say Lithuanians don't like that, but we still have that post-Soviet mentality in terms that we, we think that we understand better how Belarusians are uh, looking at the world, how they perceive relations with uh, authorities, other countries, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what is important uh, is the fact that we, Lithuania and other Baltic states, we have uh, kind of achieved uh, specific goals uh, uh, which are different from, from Belarus, let's say. So today, Lithuania and Baltic states are members of NATO and the EU. Yeah? For us, it's very important. It helped a lot to raise our economy, to improve significantly our democratic human rights, uh, rule of law, and all other important standards. Yeah? Uh, for us, it was a big, big success uh, because it yeah, helped us to achieve many, many things we were not able to achieve under Soviet rule or uh, Russian Empire occupation and other things. So today, especially after the joining of uh, European Union and NATO in 2004, that uh, spread of democracy, spread of rule of law and, and human rights became kind of cornerstone, on, cornerstone of foreign policy, not only of Lithuania, but of all other Baltic states. I believe that's also a cornerstone of European Union's foreign policy. Uh, and it's natural, yeah. Everybody wants to have uh, stable, prosperous, uh, and democratic countries on their borders. Belarus is uh, one of the biggest uh, neighbors of Lithuania. We have the longest border. So naturally, we care a lot about what's going on there. Uh, there is one more important factor which affects relations, uh, our relations, but I believe European relations with Belarus as well. So it's an issue or question of Russia. Uh, Russia in all uh, Baltic states at least is perceived as the biggest threat to our security. Uh, because of very natural reasons, Russia has occupied us for many times uh, before. Russia has been doing very, very bad things in Georgia, in Ukraine, uh, you know, all these things. Uh, so naturally, Lithuania 
since we also have Kaliningrad region, which uh, kind of surrounds uh, Baltic countries, both uh, makes Russia a uh, neighbor of Lithuania, both from east and both from west, uh, and military rhetorics, uh, imperialistic actually kind of uh, actions uh, by Russia is of very, very big concern in Lithuania. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, let's stop uh, with explanation why Belarus is important, uh, but uh, how that affects what Lithuania is uh, trying to do and what generally we are doing in, in, in relation to Belarus. So, several most important elements uh, is, uh, one of them is, of course, uh, as I mentioned already, spread of democracy, human rights, and, and rule of law work with uh, civil society, supports to its development. Uh, Lithuania has two-track uh, approach, let's say, to Belarus. On the one hand, the, is those, there are those positive measures. Yeah, we try to encourage people in Belarus to uh, kind of fight for their political, democratic, and all other rights, a positive track. On the other hand, we have, uh, let's say, negative track. Yeah, so it's uh, restrictive measures, let's call it sanctions on those who violate all these democratic principles, human rights, and other things, actually to authorities in, in Belarus. Yeah? Uh, Lithuania, all other Baltic countries uh, are well known for very strict, uh, hard, actually, position when it comes to applying sanctions, punishing those uh, who violate all these uh, democratic human rights things. It happened after 2006 election. It happened after 2010 election. It's happening now. Uh, if you look at what Lithuania is doing today, so Lithuania, together with Estonia and Latvia, actually, uh, were the first countries to introduce national sanctions to authorities or to people in Belarusian elites, let's say, including President Lukashenko. We are encouraging very strongly and asking all other Western countries to follow our path. The uh, European Union is uh, already approaching to, 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 to do that. Uh, however, what Lithuania is uh, trying to do is to make those sanctions uh, uh, much bigger, let's say, to make the list of those, uh, it was mentioned by Miriam, if I'm not wrong, that there is a need to create a kind of knowledge for those who uh, perform all those violations and so on, that they're, they're going to be punished one day. Of course, there is a problem that when it comes to Okay, implementation, uh, enforcement of law in Belarus, uh, especially international law, there are a lot of problems. Eh? There is only one law in Belarus, it's Lukashenko. And if Lukashenko's law doesn't work, there is another law, it's Putin's law. Yeah? So, and uh, we know, you all know how Russia is approaching, uh, what is Russian attitude towards international law, international criminal court and all other things. Eh? It's not very positive, to put it uh, simply. Uh, so uh, uh, that dual track approach, uh, it's, uh, it has been always on Lithuanian agenda towards uh, Belarus. Uh, uh, Lithuania has always been trying to be a kind of leader when it comes to formulating policies towards Belarus. What we do today, actually, it also kind of illustration of that, uh, uh, let's say, leadership. So uh, as I mentioned, Lithuania already introduced uh, sanctions. Uh, Lithuania has all already opened so-called humanitarian corridor for people who were suppressed or persecuted in Belarus to come to Lithuania. Uh, you know very well, uh, Ms. Tsikhanovskaya is already here in Vilnius, uh, European Humanities University, a lot of Belarusian NGOs which were denied registration or possibility to work in Belarus. They also operate here in Vilnius. So Vilnius generally, of course, because of geographical uh, right. peculiar Similarities, yeah, is a kind of important center for demo okay, people who want to introduce democracy <coughs> in Belarus. So Lithuania is home to them. Uh, Lithuanian government uh, yesterday, not yesterday, two days ago, allocated uh, 100,000 euros for humanitarian support to those, uh, let's say, uh, facing problems in, in, in Belarus. Uh, what else Lithuania is doing together with other Baltic countries, with Poland to some respect. So we are trying to uh, increase the knowledge of Belarusian problems on European level. Uh, how, uh, what we think here in Lithuania, main thing is that Europe, okay, doesn't care too much about uh, Belarus. 
And this is, okay, it's, it's a perception we have here because the belief is, uh, we've talked to many Americans, uh, Germans, uh, French people, and they say, oh, let's uh, deal, let's kind of uh, solve that problem with, through Moscow. And this is the, the words of American and German politicians. Uh, this is what we care very much about and which is what we are concerned very much about. Yeah? That Russia first approach, it's logical uh, when, when we look from geopolitical point of view. Yeah? But when, it, when we look from human rights, uh, legal point of view, it, it, it's, it makes no sense. But this is where the problem is actually, that uh, difficult balance uh, between a okay, normative approach, uh, what should be done, and practical approach, uh, what is really working and what are real interests of uh, one or another uh, country. So uh, to end uh, perhaps up, uh, I'll uh, uh, name several most important concerns which, uh, which is uh, discussed very strongly at the moment in Lithuania. So first of all, uh, there is a big, big fear that we, I mean West in general, may lose a momentum of democracy. Yeah? Uh, it was a big, big shock how Belarusian society reacted to those rigged elections in Belarus. Yeah? So, uh, and we, those people in Belarus, they are still kind of uh, have that belief that uh, change may come. Yeah? Uh, if we look retro retrospectively, uh, it happened also after 2006 elections. It happened also after 2010 elections. Uh, how it ended? It ended uh, in no way. Yeah? In terms of that Lukashenko suppressed everybody and uh, there was no real, I mean, practical reaction, reaction from the West. So the fear is that it may repeat once again. Yeah? And what we ask uh, all the West to do is just not to allow that to happen, one thing. Yeah? Uh, on the other hand, and that's related to first thing, is uh, that uh, kind of looking for a solution through Moscow may untie Russian hands. Yeah? Uh, okay, we all know Russia has those specific interests uh, within its specific sphere of interest, how they define that. Yeah? And Belarus uh, falls into that sphere of influence. And if there is a kind of agreement, uh, maybe not uh, official, not formal, but agreement that, okay, West allows Russia to solve, let's say, that problem with Belarus. So generally, our understanding is that at the end of the day, there will be, Lithuania at least, will have Russian border on its east uh, side, not Belarusian border. And this is what's actually happening. Yeah? Because uh, today, Mr. Mishustin, who is prime minister of, of, of Belarus, of Russia, has came to Belarus. Minsk. Uh, Minsk, uh, Lukashenko is calling only Putin. He's traveling to Minsk uh, next week, perhaps. Uh, Russia is pushing very strongly for that uh, practical establishment of uh, union state between Belarus and Russia. So for us, it's very practical concern, yeah? because it's better to have uh, authoritarian, but Belarus on our borders. Uh, it's very cynic, but uh, better to have Belarus with Lukashenko on our borders rather than uh, Russia on our borders. Uh, it's the reality we, we face and this is how we approach the situation. So these are some general comments and some general ideas we, we kind of share here in Lithuania about Belarus. So I'm ready for discussion and any questions. Thank you. Lorenas, thank you very much, um, because that does give us a different kind of perspective. It's looking in from a neighboring country and what the political implications are for you, um, um, but also presenting us with the reality that certain uh, outside pressures may be brought to bear at a higher level and likely to come to nothing. And it fits in with Elena's idea that the support has to come uh, from below uh, if we are to offer support at all. Um, I just want to, 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 to do, before I, I bring my discussion in um, uh, uh, Bill and uh, Boris. I just want to uh, uh, do a little sort of s summation at this point. I mean, what, what we have in, in the descriptions that we've had already are that the clear egregious human rights abuses that we're seeing and the atrocities that have taken place, that there's a breach of every human right, as, as Constantine has said, uh, the taking of life, uh, no freedom to protest, arbitrary detentions, rape, uh, uh, beatings in custody, access no 
to lawyers being uh, really um, interfered with and blocked for hearings um, and uh, a rubber stamping by judges. One of the of, of our questioners on, on the sidebar has said, you know, the, 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 the judges have something to, to, to answer to. Um, uh, political imprisonment, um, the taking of jobs from people, sort of extrajudicial punishments. Um, attacks on journalists and the freedom of the media and closing down of, uh, of ways of communicating. And of course, the whole interference with self-determination because of the undermining of democracy and the stealing of elections and the, and the rigging of them. So, I mean, we're, we're seeing a panoply of, of, of horror, which um, our, our witnesses um, have given testimony to. And uh, I, 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 I am with um, uh, Miriam on this in terms of, you know, you have to use tools. I'm a big believer now in targeted sanctions. It's one of the things that does teeth uh, 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 to international law and to the international community that you you freeze the assets of these people and you list them and name them and you don't let them have visas to, to come into countries where they want to come and they want to deposit their loot and do their shopping etc. So um, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that we, we have to use Magnitsky law and the Khodorkovsky discussion that Miriam described uh, is one that I think we've all learned lessons from and Bill Bowring's work work on all of that has been really um, important. Um, the to-do list. I just want to say that, I mean, it, um, um, a, and a number of you have said this, that there has to be a call from the international community to say that there has to be a ceasing of violence and a ceasing of arrests, and that we have to be talking with and see the creation of, uh, of uh, coordination councils and somehow that there has to be some mediated dialogue that has to take place, that we, that's what we should be calling for. And calling for new elections that should be observed and have the international community um, overseeing them and also call for constitutional change. I mean, this is in the big picture thing. On the side, I've had a number of questions, and before I bring in Bill and Boris, I just wanted to say that Anthony Wenton raises the question, and it was in my mind too, which was, you know, do you, uh, I mean, the, the parallel uh, uh, is with Venezuela. Um, it, it can backfire on you when, when you see uh, you know, a government in exile being accepted by the international community and, uh, and, and whether that's successful or not. Um, uh, and, and it's a, and it's a tr tricky one. Um, uh, um, we have a whole business about um, a, another question that comes from um, Guy Martin, who says, um, complaints under the ICCPR, the International Con uh, Convention for Civil and Political Rights, if there were a number of complaints that could be sort of brought together, that it could actually, um, if they were mobilized, it could become a sort of rallying cry for the international community and embarrass certainly and, and, uh, and humiliate uh, uh, um, the, the governance in, in, Lithuania, in, in Belarus. Can it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, Torlach, uh, an Irish colleague, is saying, you know, there could be a gathering of evidence on the outside. It's one of the things that we could do. Set up a task force. You set up a, um, a, a kind of uh, um, some sort of rapid response task force where just now where you collect together um, the testimonies of those who have been uh, beaten up, who've experienced torture, the, the sexual humiliations and rape in, in custody uh, suites, um, the ways in which um, people have uh, lost jobs, all of those things being uh, collected before before it's lost and, and while it's still fresh in people's minds, um, that ways in which um, uh, you could have, um, I think it was constant and mentioned, a fact-finding mission. Um, um, but many of the people, I mean, it probably would be difficult for people on the outside to get in. I don't know how that would work. But you certainly now, we have this in ways of hearing testimony that doesn't involve people having to travel. Um, and. Uh, I do think that um, uh, some of our international lawyers might be able to talk to us about ways in which we can use um, international law. Are, are, are there any mechanisms there that we could we could use as tools um, in 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 dealing with uh, this kind of corruption and uh, and uh, uh, authoritarian um, uh, uh, governance? So, Bill and Boris, I'm going to come over to you and let me introduce you to. Um, to our participants. Um, 
I have my notes and uh, and I was very anxious that we got it all right. Um, Boris uh, Silovich, you're going to have to uh, tell me if I'm really doing terrible damage to your to the description of your name. Please forgive me. But um, um, is is Latvian and he's uh, uh, um, uh, in the Social Democratic Party Democrat Party. Concord, um, and he'll explain that. And uh, he's been a deputy of uh, his parliament in Latvia. Um, he's the chair of something called PACE, and it's a committee on legal affairs and human rights. Um, and he is a represent has been a representative to the Council of Europe. And so Boris is, is one of our of our uh, commentators, and Bill Bowring. Um, well known to all of us, is a professor of law here at um, uh, and human rights um, at Birkbeck College, um, which is part of London University. He's the co-founder of the Bar Human Rights Committee and the um, uh, uh, European Human Rights uh, Advocacy Centre. Um, and he's been a great voice on uh, internationalism, he knows a lot about uh, um, this part of the world. And so I'm going to bring in Boris first and then over to Bill. Boris. Show us the way. Give us direction of travel. Give us give us some of your thoughts. I can't hear you. You've got to uh, turn in my micro now. Now I hope it's fine. Yes, can you yes. hear me now? Uh, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Constantine, and other organizers, because it's really very useful for me to, to hear your views and uh, concrete proposals, and uh, I, I will explain why. So I am actually wearing two hats. So first, my hat of the Latvian MP and Vice Chair of the Committee on uh, Human Rights. So as Laurina correctly pointed out, we in the Baltic states have very special relations with Belarus. So for Latvia, Belarus is the closest member, uh, neighbor with centuries long friendly and family ties and Belarusians make the second biggest minority in Latvia and of course Belarus is also a very important economic partner and particularly in the field of transit and electricity supply. And apparently due to these reasons, Latvia has always played a special role, just like Lithuania, in the EU's relations with Belarus, but somewhat different from Lithuania. So it's actually not as an advocate, but uh, as a sort of a good cop. <laughs> Uh, however, after the recent events we are discussing now, this is certainly not possible any longer. The position of the Latvian Saima, the parliament, is very clear. On 18th of August, the Saima, it's, it's extraordinary session, unanimously adopted a strong statement. Besides general political condemnation, we called for some practical measures, in particular introduction of personal sanctions against the persons responsible for human rights violations. And I fully agree that indeed this targeted individual sanctions are real and effective too. And this was done in Latvia. So last week, uh, these uh, sanctions have been adopted against 30 persons, including Mr. Lukashenko himself. And we also strongly supporting similar sanctions at the level of the European Union. Besides, Latvia allocated 150,000 euros, a bit more than Lithuania did, for supporting civil society and independent media in Belarus in cooperation with Latvian NGOs. Some other measures are discussed, in particular to help the Belarusian students to continue their education in Latvian universities and some businesses which are persecuted for supporting process, uh, protests to continue working in Latvia and so on. And uh, of course, there is a very difficult question of general economic sanctions, which is also under discussion now. But of course, this is important to impose sanctions on perpetrators of the human rights violations, not on the Belarusians, people uh, as a whole, uh, not to provoke more poverty and more deprivation of, of the people, and this is not an easy issue. Now I am taking off my Latvian hat and putting on my Council of Europe uh, hat. Uh, indeed, I am a member of the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly and currently chair its Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights. But I would like to stress that I am authorized to represent neither the Assembly nor the organization in general. So my remarks are strictly in my personal capacity. 
So as uh, Sergei Dickman mentioned today and explained the situation, so Belarus is not a Council of Europe member state and therefore is not formally bound by its standards. However, even if Belarus is not a part of the Council of Europe, it is a part of Europe and has once applied for membership in the Council of Europe and grave and massive violations of human rights, such as those observed since the presidential elections, uh, in particular amount to breaches of international use Coggins norms. Here I agree with Konstantin, and therefore we cannot uh, stay indifferent. Uh, Laurina has mentioned, uh, 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 and Sergei uh, mentioned already several statements made by the Council of Europe leaders, in particular the statement adopted on 26th of August jointly by the President of the Committee of Ministers, President of the Parliamentary Assembly, Rick Dems, and the Secretary General. So everything is correct, yes, uh, but in my personal view this is not enough for the organization which defines itself as a watchdog for human rights and democracy in Europe. Next week, several assemblies will at their meetings consider the current situation in Belarus. In particular, Svetlana Tikhanovska will address the Political Affairs Committee and Legal Affairs Committee, what I have an honor to chair, uh, will discuss the legal aspects of uh, this situation. So I believe that even if the Council of Europe does not have a formal jurisdiction over Belarus, it has sufficient expertise, certain mechanisms and experience to substantially contribute to documentation and investigation of grave violations committed by the authorities and into restoration of justice and ensuring accountability for, 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 of the perpetrators. Our committee will explore proper ways how to achieve this goal and your ideas and proposals are really very useful for us. So for quite uh, many years, we'll, we are stressing that impunity is the main enemy of human rights. So all perpetrators must be brought to justice. And I very much hope that uh, our parliamentary assembly and uh, other organs and bodies of the Council of Europe will contribute into this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Boris, thank you very much. You, you, you're actually one of the, sec one of the people, I, I, I certainly remember that someone else also mentioned this, that it is important that people know that there will be a reckoning, that there, there will come a time when the people who are leading a country that is doing this to its own people, that there will be a reckoning at some point, and they have to be made to see that that is a, a serious intent. Um, Bill, um, help me. Um, you were going to uh, come in, and you're my last uh, uh, speaker. I've got some questions on the side, but uh, uh, tell, tell me what uh, thoughts came to you as you listened to our contributors. Thank you, Elena. It's a great honor to be here as a discussant, first of all. And of course, uh, Kansansin is the expert, uh, and Natalia, when it comes to the really horrific human rights violations that we've been seeing in response to this real uprising, actually, against uh, Lukashenko, which has been taking place and is still taking place. So um, I just want to, what I want to add to that is to say for reasons which I'll make clear that I think one of the main jobs we have to do is to raise awareness of what is an incredibly dangerous situation at this moment. So I don't think we're talking about long term, you know, who can be brought to court and when, but I think short term things are, are really very dangerous indeed. I just want to say a few words about the history of Belarus. And we tend to forget that as Belarusia uh, it became a member of the United Nations in 1945. So you had this very weird situation where the Soviet Union was a member and a member of the uh, Security Council uh, as a permanent member with a veto, but Ukraine and Belarus were both made members of the United Nations with seats in the General Assembly. And in fact, Belarusia didn't become Belarus until 1991 uh, when the Soviet Union broke up. And Belarus, or Belarus, was always known as the most conservative part of the Soviet Union. It was known as the Soviet Vendée, you know, that is um, where the Soviet 
uh, approach and way of life and the best building standards in the Soviet Union and the most clean streets uh, all in Belarus. I was actually there in the early 90s with Piers Gardner, a fellow barrister, and we were sent by the Foreign Office in the time of Mr. Shushkevich, this is all in the very dim and distant past, uh, who for a few years was the head of, uh, head of Belarus before Lukashenko was elected in July 1994. And what we were doing with Mr. Shushkevich was talking about how Belarus could become a democratic state. And so that was questions of the constitution, of the constitutional court, and really some remarkable people working on it at that time. From 1994 onwards, what has been happening is Lukashenko entrenching and entrenching and entrenching. And of course, he's got ambitions, not only in Belarus, but uh, in the former Soviet Union. Uh, we now have the State Union for quite a long time now of Belarus and Russia. And uh, as we've already heard, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Russia is there now. Um, Putin is almost certainly going there. And what is going on is two dictators, uh, Lukashenko for 28 years, Putin now for 20 years, and both of whom are having completely unexpected uprisings on their territory. I mean, Belarus is in Minsk, in Brest, in other cities in Belarus, masses of people on the streets. In Russia, which is rather big, what we've seen is very large numbers of people on the streets of Khabarovsk <laughs> uh, because their election was stolen from them. And in Russia, the situation is also absolutely unpredictable. Why has Alexei Navalny been poisoned with Novichok? Really? Uh, you know, this is the most serious opposition figure in Russia. And you have to think that the regime in Russia is extremely worried by recent developments and Navalny poses a real threat. And that's why he gets the same treatment as the Skripals and the unfortunate uh, women who died in the United Kingdom. This is military grade nerve agent, by the way, um, which is being used against uh, Navalny and now he's in Germany. So what is the danger at the present moment? I think the danger is that Lukashenko is trying to play a card which will get Russia involved. And I heard somebody this morning at a Chatham House meeting, so which wasn't Chatham House rules, so I can say this, uh, saying that there's a real danger of a provocation where Lukashenko dresses people up in uniforms of Lithuania and Poland, and there's a provocation in order to get Russia involved. That is the extreme danger. And that's, so I, I'm fully in support of what Boris uh, has to say, of course, but the Parliamentary Assembly, as Kansan Sin has pointed out, doesn't have a very great record, I'm sure this is not Baris's fault, on lifting sanctions against Russia in relation to Crimea uh, last year. And there was less of an outcry about that than there should have been. And this is bad news, as a matter of fact, for the Council of Europe, in fact. I think, you know, okay. And targeted sanctions, Magnitsky sanctions, um, as Helena has said, very, very good. Does Russia play a buying bit of notice to targeted sanctions? Um, Russian politicians even boast about being uh, the subject of, of targeted sanctions under Magnitsky and in relation to Crimea and Donbass. That raises the danger, I think, um, of Russian intervention, which could happen very, very soon. And really, so just to return to where I started, that I think our job is, of course, solidarity with these incredibly brave people taking part in the uprising in Belarus. And I hope they're able to organize themselves. I hope that uh, leaders emerge, I'm sure they will do, uh, and that there's a possibility of change. So uh, that goes without saying. But, but I do think on the other side, it is not sufficiently recognized across the world how dangerous this situation is for the whole of Europe. And um, when we hear from our colleagues from Latvia and Lithuania, and there's a whole chunk of the Russian Federation called Kaliningrad, right in the middle of the European Union. We tend to forget that also. So this is about, I think, as bad as bad as it could be. Sorry to be pessimistic. Well, um... 
we've really um, come to uh, uh, our, our witching hour because it's now half past seven, so we've been uh, in discussion for an hour and a half. And I do know that Miriam is having to, to leave us. And Miriam, that, this, that, that we did, did agree that we would be here for an hour and a half. Um, but um, I, I just wanted to, first of all, say that um, the situation is dire. And we've really started, started tickling at some of the things that could be done. Um, I want. I don't want us to leave here tonight without us sort of having some sense of where we go next. I would like this to be the beginning of uh, of a set of uh, opportunities like this one, where we might come together um, to have further discussions. Um, uh, but uh, and one of the questions that came um, from someone who's uh, watching proceedings uh, was to ask about um, uh, the the recording of this event, um, whether it was being recorded, um, uh, whether it was, um, uh, it was possible to access it, um, uh, could it be posted, etc. Um, I don't know the answer to that because I, 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 despite being thanked for helping to organize this, um, I have to tell you that uh, I shouldn't get any credit. The wonderful person who organized this was Jonathan Cooper, who's a member of our chambers at Doughty Street, and he drew us all together and in, in, invited the IBA, um, International Bar Associations Institute, into this uh, uh, gathering. And I want to thank him formally because he is one of the great forces uh, for human rights in our midst, and I want to um, pay tribute to him. Um, but um, um, I, uh, I just don't know about the answer about whether this could be accessed and, uh, and shared with others. I'm, I'm sure somebody will let me know. Um, I'm just going to have a look at the questions that have come up. Um, uh, as someone is saying that Lukashenko could not survive without Putin's support, um, so we should think of sanctions against Russia as well. As Miriam mentioned, the Navalny poisoning can be linked with Belarus and momentum uh, could build up against Nord Stream 2. Um, Antonia uh, uh, says, thank you for this webinar, it's been very interesting and I feel like I have a better grasp on what's happening in Belarus and I think that's probably true of anyone who's um, an outsider and thank you to all of you who've got great expertise. Um, uh, um, there's a suggestion that um, the Russian uh, 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 government doesn't need much provocation, that they'll be involved anyway um and uh, i think i think bill's um uh final words to us that um that this is this what's happening in belarus of course is putting the jitters into um, putin because of uh, of the the spread of this could have serious consequences um but uh, but also the crushing of it can have serious consequences and um i don't know but many of you might share my 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 concerns which is that um, well, we, on the one hand, we're seeing a yearning of the, the people of Belarus wanting self-determination, wanting a different kind of uh, governance and so on. We're also seeing in other parts of uh, Eastern Europe um, the rise of, a, of, uh, of you know, self-called illiberal democracy um, and a form of sort of uh, neo-fascism in places. And so I think that we should be anxious about what is happening around, around democracy. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure that um, even our, our discussions as uh, advocates of law and human rights um, can feel sanguine about what's taking place. Um, I want us to, 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 to take some threads from this. The suggestions were made that we should be um, encouraging the Council of Europe to, to, to carry on doing the work that Boris and Sergei um, spoke about. Um, I want to know whether there is any purpose in us doing a, a gathering, um, um, a, a sort of, if you like, a sort of rapid response to gather um, uh, uh, statements from people about what's been happening so that we, we have, uh, is that happening? Does anyone know, Natalia, is that happening in, just now in Belarus? Is there, is there a documenting of all, the, of all these uh, uh, terrible things that people are experiencing? What's happening to lawyers, to journalists, to, to the, the, have we interviewed the, uh, uh, the families of those who've been killed, um, those who've been raped in custody and so on. Um, I, I hear that Peter Duncan says it is happening. Well, uh, that's, that's terrific. And it's, a, it's important to archive that and to get it out. There's a very good um, uh, um, app called Eyewitness, um, which actually 
has an archive and it will immediately, if you put things onto it, um, can ar archive things uh, for you, particularly if it's film and so on, um, which can be used then eventually in international courts. Um, I hear from Peter Duncan that there are numerous organisations who are doing precisely this and that's, that's wonderful. Um, is there anything that anyone wants to raise as a way of a sort of concrete suggestion that we can take this forward, as well as deciding that um, perhaps in a month or so we might try to reconvene a meeting of this sort? Um, is there anything that anyone would... Elena? Um, just very, very quickly. Thank you, very much, Elena, for this. Um, I think fact-finding that uh, Constantine already mentioned is very important, mm -hmm. but we need a task force to be set up by the EU that also the, the UK uh, uh, in combination, simply because we can use all sorts of platforms now, you know, from Zoom, from, uh, you know, uh, WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, uh, basically to take evidence, to collect evidence from those people who are now afraid actually to speak up and go to the police to report about the beatings because uh, if we can provide that kind of set up that task force, but also offer some local support for people to evidence that with further documentation, that will be a massive help to, to, to civil society in terms of collecting evidence and building the case. Um, there's a suggestion coming through and, and Bill's endorsing it that there might be something done about bringing lawyers together, um, the IBA and the, the, the UK uh, uh, um, uh, Bar Human Rights Committee um, to, to, to raise issues about, um, uh, about law and the way in which lawyers are, are, are not being, being given access to their clients, the ways in which. And also one of, one of the questioners who's put a question in said, what happens about these judges who are rubber stamping this stuff? Do the judges of Belarus belong to any international judicial organizations? Is there a way uh, that, that uh, um, the, the, the organizations of international judges can bring some pressure to bear on judges and say, you have responsibilities to protect the rule of law and its independence? Con Constantine, please. Yeah, thank, th thank you very much. I, I really wanted to comment on this particular point that uh, you mentioned, but also I wanted to support what Yelena just said. And indeed, uh, fact finding is crucial. And some NGOs like Vesna, for example, they're doing an amazing job uh, collecting evidence. But I think that it needs to go uh, further than that. And it needs a gravitas uh, of an international organization like the Parliamentary Assembly to be a hub that would put together like people in Belarus who, uh, who I think Miriam is saying goodbye. Uh, no, at this point. I, well, I'm not sure whether, hold, pause for a minute, Constantine. I don't know whether Miriam is saying goodbye or whether she'd like to say a word before she goes. Miriam? I wanted to say something, but then I had, had to run. But since you give me, gave me the floor, I just wanted to say that I know uh, when we were working with uh, civil society in Syria, that uh, uh, there was a British legal organization, but I don't know exactly who was the author, but I can find out who has developed an application that the British courts guaranteed that pictures and films done through that application were uh, guaranteed their, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? The authenticity. Authenticity. That, that, that's so eyewitness. That it's, it's, and that place and that hour. Yeah, that's, that's called Eyewitness and it's run by my organization. The International Bar Association is the home of Eyewitness, which created that app. And that app can be used to take film for people on demonstrations and so on. And you press the button twice and it's taken to an archive and it's uh, saved. And we've already um, secured a number of convictions in, uh, um, uh, in courts in, uh, in, you know, in places where um, we were able to show horrible things happening. So it's, it's an important Thing. Great, great too. But th does Viesna, the, the human rights organization in Belarus, they, do they use that? Do they know about it? Because they, I, 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 I see Boris nodding his head, but I, I don't know whether, whether it's been used in, in, in Belarus. Uh, be an, a way to I make say, them yeah. approach and tell them about this application. So it's mm -hmm. widely used in Belarus. Well, there's, there's Natalia um, nodding her head. Does anybody else want to come in before I sort of Boris? 
Uh, and then I'm going to go back to Constantine. Uh -huh. uh, yes, very briefly to comment on this possibility to have a rapporteur on Belarus in the parliamentary assembly. It's, it's really important to each committee appoints a rapporteur because if it's political affairs committee, it's less related to particular human rights violations. And in the meantime, the legal affairs committee several years ago had a very important report by Christos Porgoridis about uh, forced disappearances in Belarus. And indeed, this report uh, discovered, actually uncovered many things which were not known before that. Although, of course, we are not a prosecutor's body, are not investigators, but sometimes parliamentary investigation can be very successful. And this is one of the possibilities we are going to discuss. Thank you. Th thank you, Boris. I mean, I've got a message here from uh, Torloch, who's our French colleague, uh, our, our, our Irish colleague, is saying we should be urging the UK and the EU to give funding and to back uh, up those NGOs that are collecting the evidence and that they should be supported in doing that. Um, uh, there's a, a shout out for Jonathan, um, and I'm going to add my voice to it, Jonathan uh, Cooper, who helped us put all of this together. I mean, who was the instigator, and God bless him. And, uh, um, and uh, Kapil Gupta is saying that he's learned a lot. I think we all have. Um, and he said it would also be good to learn, perhaps at a future event, what those who fund civil society organisations in the region can do, and more importantly, what they shouldn't do in order to support, support local civil society. So, um, uh, Constantine, come yeah, in. And you may have to be my last. Yeah. I will be very quick. Uh, sorry about that. So just coming back to your point about uh, judges. Judges in Belarus uh, are very different to what you call judges in the United Kingdom. Like they are very much civil servants that uh, actually uh, uh, just uh, um, impose uh, whatever uh, they're supposed to impose in these particular circumstances. Uh, and uh, I don't think that any sort of uh, external pressure, unless it is some personal sanctions, but that is, then you will have to sanction extremely uh, broad number of people might uh, uh, make any impacts on Belarusian judiciary. This is a, a really a part of the state which is having some facade of uh, sort of independent. All judges are uh, nominated. All appointed. Appointed, appointed by the president. Yeah, yeah they are all appointed by the president. Normally, they are appointed for the period of five years, and they will have to be reappointed after five years. What sort of independence are we talking about? And no, no, it's, that's not independence. <laughs> that's there not independence. is no independence, uh, indeed. Like, and some people say that like there is ind no independence only in political sense, but there is no. You cannot be somehow independent. I mean, you cannot be a little bit pregnant. And you cannot be a little bit independent in that. Listen, one I'm of finishing. The, yeah, Constantine, one of the things, uh, and colleagues, one of the things we all have to know is that uh, the authorities, one of the first things they do is they go after the, to the judiciary and they, and they disempower them and they make them their, their um, playthings. You know, they, they make them subservient to them. They go after any critics. You know, it's like Putin just now and, uh, and anybody who's, who's, a, who's a critic. Uh, it, they go after the lawyers. They go after the, the, the uh, journalists. We know that that's what happens in authoritarian regimes. And this has all of that, all the appurtenances of that. And uh, as someone, uh, one of our, our, our um, uh, uh, listeners has just uh, uh, said that he's worked in uh, Belarus and that the judge, it's Harry Hummel. And he says that the judges um, do not belong to the International Association of Judges. And of course they wouldn't be given, given what you've just told us. He says that the um, prosecutors do belong to the International Association of Prosecutors, but that that is an organization that does not tend to uh, become proactive in these sort of circumstances about the conduct and behavior of the of the prosecutors that are members of their organization so it sounds like it's a club for having uh, you know um, uh, boondoggles in nice places anyway um so uh, um, I, I think this has been a really really fascinating uh, discussion and I, I particularly want to thank our colleagues who are you know are zooming in from uh, other parts of the world um, you know from the region from uh, 
Boris and Sergei and uh, and uh, 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 Lorianas. I've got to make sure that I pronounce your name properly. And Natalia, um, but uh, but my colleagues are all here in the UK too, um, uh, and it's wonderful that. Um, uh, we have you in our midst and, and that you're reminding us of how important it is that we speak out on, on this. Um, Harry Hummel is saying something to me. He's saying the International Association of Prosecutors should be pro pressurized by us as, or, as lawyers, you know, um, that we should be putting the, the pressure on them to be doing something about this, and we should be. So um, I want to thank all of you. Um, I hope that uh, you'll get on to Jonathan and think uh, of an occasion when we can meet again, and that you, in the meantime, we should be using our creative forces to think about ways in which we can be proactive. And all of us in our different organizations should be uh, supporting the law lawyers, intervening with the International Association of Prosecutors, uh, criticizing the judges, and, and making sure that we speak out about the horrible abuses of human rights that are taking place here, and, uh, and keep the heat on uh, um, uh, what's taking place. Natalia, all power to your elbow, darling. Um, I, I, it must be very hard doing what you're doing, um, but we're here supporting you. Okay, bless you. Okay, thank you all. It was a terrific evening. Thank you, and I'm sorry that, that our, our Friends in Belarus are suffering so much. Thank you.